Everyone, welcome to another for like webinar. Thank you for joining us. Um, this format is like the last one. We are answering questions live. We have a panelist of experts from Floor Life who, um, who are gonna answer the questions that you sent in uh, and that you send in. So during the webinar, if you have any questions, please use the chat function on your screen. Um, type us the question that you have, and then we'll make sure they get answered. If not, at the end of this webinar live, we'll email you or we might schedule another webinar to answer questions. Um, the people we have today are Marco Marquez. He's Floor Life's Global Sales Director. We also have Steve Don. He's Floor Life's Director of Superfloor Technologies, the Americas. Then we have Emma Bradford. She's Floor Life's technical support uh, representative, and she's located in the UK. Um, and then we have Alan Tanoy. He's Floor Life's director of Global Wholesale Channel, located in the US. We were supposed to have Mark Allen, who's Floor Life's global product manager and sustainability expert, except he had a dental issue this morning, and um, I, I think he's still being. Um, worked on, so he couldn't join us, sadly. But that doesn't mean that we won't answer your sustainability questions. So send them to us. Um, we'll make sure that we email you the answer or that Mark gets in touch with you. Um, just send us whatever you have and, and we'll try and get you the, the answer you're looking for. So welcome everyone. Thank you for, for joining me once again for another webinar. I'm gonna start with a Valentine's Day question. Uh, quite a lot of Valentine's Day questions came, um, came in. I think it's because it's the time of year to start prepping for that. Um, and one of the questions that we got was, with Valentine's Day around the corner, what is the current outlook on flower availability, quality, and how about pricing? Do you have any words of advice to help us prepare better? Steve, could you help us out? Sure. Uh, this is a, uh, it's a real common question. Uh, at this time of year. And uh, I've reached out to a couple of uh, key players in Latin America, um, in both Colombia and Ecuador, and also actually in Costa Rica as well, excuse me, all three countries that, I'm a, that I work with closely. And uh, so a couple of things that a uh, little update on what's, um, what's around the corner. Um, let's start with weather, which is uh, probably the initial interest. Um, we are getting a lot of rain in Latin America and all three countries. Uh, that sounds like that could be a bad thing, and it could be if, in fact, the growers um, don't adhere to the protocols to maintain uh, clean production and such. But believe it or not, there's a silver lining to rain, and that, that means that there is no freezing. That is the other worry this time of year, that we get freezes, which uh, can be so damaging that it'll reduce the number of stems. Uh, so as long as there's rain, there's no freezing, the humidity uh, gets into the soil, it uh, generates that, that protective coating, if you would, if you want to imagine something. So that's good news. Uh, let me just also talk quickly about the volume of flowers. Uh, we are online to have a very successful production with volume. Um, the flowers are coming on uh, on time so far. We still have days to go. Um, also sizing seems to be a positive as well. People are noticing, especially on roses, some good sizing. Um, the flower actually also is very well balanced. This is a very interesting uh, commentary about how things are. It tells the history of the production of the flower from, let's just take a rose, for example, from the moment that we pinch the rose plant to generating this product that we hope to gather for Valentine's Day. And if the flower is balanced, meaning the, the stem is uh, tapers correctly, the leaf quality is good, the leaf sizing is good as it goes up the flower, that last node or that last piece of stem is not too light green, too long, creating some head. So we see none of those things at this time. That's all great news. So I'm bringing a lot of great news to the table on that. One last point is transportation. Here's the other side of the coin. Uh, transportation continues to be a logistical difficulty, not only from Latin America to Miami or, or to the U.S., but also within Latin America, the, the movement of some ocean freight containers, uh, the airports, the availability of airspace is at a premium, much lower than what the industry needs. This generates a cost factor. Get ready for that conversation with your supplier. And of course, also the trucking issue from Miami or from wherever the port of entry is to the marketplace is going to be difficulty. Uh, so uh, logistically, uh, the transportation is difficult. 
Um, I think that's all I want to occupy my time with. That's, uh, that's a little bit of an update. Thanks, Steve. Marco, how about Europe and Africa? Anything that you want to mention? Yeah, it's pretty similar to what uh, Steve uh, shared with us about uh, Latin America, where the majority of the flowers are grown, which are in Southern North America. So um, growers overall are uh, pretty happy about uh, the yield they are seeing. The weather has been favorable, which is good. Um, the pricing is also very good, which of course is uh, pretty much in favor of the, for the growers. So they see an increase in pricing. At the same time, we observe in Europe that uh, in some markets, there is certainly a lack of flowers, not so much on roses, uh, but on other varieties. And that has simply to do with an increased demand we see because uh, big parts of Europe uh, are still in lockdown or a partial lockdown. Um, so um, people are continue to stay much more at home that they used, than they used to. And that continues, of course, to uh, stimulate sales uh, for flowers. Um, big bottleneck out of Africa to Europe is certainly logistics. Same like in Latin America, there's a lack of air freight space, uh, belly cargo, meaning when flowers or freight travel with passenger flights is still very limited because much less flights are operated with passengers than before due to uh, the travel restrictions or the travel yeah, circumstances in general. Um, so this is certainly putting a lot of pressure uh, on the supply chain. And we also have to keep in mind that um, not only that is contributing to the logistical issues, but also uh, the lack in sea freight. So because sea freight is taking so much longer, the costs went up so much, we also see no more goods, which usually were sea freighted, being moved onto planes for yeah, timelines, but also for cost reasons. So this is all putting a lot of pressure in that sector. Um, and yeah, growers are responding to that by trying to charter their own machines in order to have more control and more grip over availability of freight space. Interesting. Alan, how about the traditional channels? Yeah, generally, the customers that I'm speaking to, the wholesalers, uh, both in Europe and in uh, the North America, are very optimistic uh, about the holiday. It kind of echoes what uh, Steve and Marco just said. So they're expecting to have a very good holiday. Uh, the sales that started to be very strong at the end of 2020 and into or beginning in the middle of 2020, all of 21, um, they people seem quite confident it will continue uh, into this early part of 2022. Uh, uh, so they're very optimistic about Valentine's Day. They expect to have, as they did last year, many, many similar problems in terms of logistics uh, and availability of flowers in terms of the types of flowers that they're looking for, specific varieties that they're looking for. But I think at this point, that's not new news to everyone. So they're kind of anticipating that. The good thing is that what most of them are telling me is that the market's become unlike pre-pandemic, the market's very flexible. So because all the retailers know, uh, all their customers know, it's hard to get specific flower types. Everyone is very open to substitutions and changes. Uh, and for most of them, basically, uh, uh, it's very difficult to predict the price. So they just, they have a standard uh, sort of policy with with customers that, hey, the price is going to be whatever the price is going to be when the flowers come in. I can give you an idea, ballpark of where you're going to be, but uh, I can't commit to a price because of all the changes or, or things that are uncertain. Uh, and there certainly has been, you know, pretty large increases in prices, uh, I think all over, it's certainly in the traditional channel, but the market is absorbing that. Uh, I think the pricing is being um, flowed through to the consumer. Uh, which you just didn't see that before. So that that's a, a good change, I would say, for the industry. Yeah. That is indeed. Emma, was there something that you wanted to add for the UK? Oh, you're on mute. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, you're still on mute. Emma doesn't want to talk to us. I think. Oh. <laughs> okay, we'll go over to the next question and then maybe you can hop in on that one. So another one regarding the holidays. 
So what are three or four things that we must do to prepare for a holiday such as Valentine's Day or Mother's Day? What is the most important? I get overwhelmed with all the recommendations that I hear from the experts. Steve? You're muted well, as well now. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm going to steal the easy one. Um, uh, but I think it's probably also at this point, the most important, as we all know, the cold chain uh, continues to be the most important thing when it comes to uh, quality and having that consumer experience that we hope our consumer has. So they buy not only a Valentine's Day, but uh, hopefully, uh, you know, every week. Uh, and that is preparing the cooler. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, our cold chain adherence is, is important. Uh, a couple of real quick things about the cooler. We want to uh, calibrate that thermometer and that thermostat. There are two different things. Your thermostat is what you set your cooler at. Your thermometer is what you measure to see if it's achieving that. Uh, if you walk up to your thermostat and it says a certain temperature, it doesn't mean that the temperature is that. That's what you hope it is. Calibrate those two things. Make sure they're working correctly. Uh, a couple other real quick things about the cooler. We want to... Um, want to clean, clean, clean. Uh, we want to use uh, something that has a residual benefit. Um, at Floral Life, we have a product called DCD. want to make sure we mix it correctly and use it. Uh, the beautiful thing about something with a residual is once you clean it, it actually prevents the fungal bacterial buildup that would come back. If you use bleach, it does clean, but then as soon as the odor is away, it's available to be reinfected. And uh, a couple more things I just want to mention, and I'll let everybody else talk, is uh, Alan mentioned a real thing about how people are okay with substituting it with this difficult issue. Line up those options as early as you possibly can because everybody else is as well. So if, um, if you have a, either a more than one uh, supplier for something or whatever, transportation benefit, whatever it is, line up those options as you possibly can because everybody else is as well. Uh, those will be my three. That's a good one, that last, last one. Alan, anything you want to add? Uh, yeah, it occurs to me that when the number one thing uh, I've always uh, heard and discussed and comes up in conversation when we're talking in the wholesale channel for retail florists or wholesalers is the need to be organized, uh, whether it's uh, for Valentine's Day in particular, but also Mother's Day or really any holiday. And I know from my own experience in wholesale for many years in Chicago, it was, uh, we always spent a lot of time planning the holiday. So I would say that my number one tip uh, for preparation for anybody in the holiday is have, a, have your plan and have your plan with your team uh, so uh, to be prepared. Uh, for example, uh, like Steve said, one of the main, something very important is temperature management in the wholesale house or at the retail florist. And so it's important that you do schedule your uh, preventive maintenance uh, with your with your supplier of your preventive maintenance uh, contracts uh, on your cooling equipment. And we would always go uh, to all of our locations and make sure that we scheduled that PM uh, on our cooling equipment prior to, with plenty of time prior to the holiday. And if uh, we would always run into issues, the worst thing that can happen, I think, is that your cooler goes down in the middle of your Valentine's Day holiday when you have the highest number of boxes of roses sitting in your cooler. Uh, we've had that happen. Uh, I ha I've had that experience before in my past. So that's a disaster you do not want to have. And by having preventive maintenance, you can try to avoid that. Uh, but you should have a generally a checklist of all of these types of items going into the holiday uh, based on your prior experience. And it's really good to go through with your team uh, that checklist prior to the holiday to make sure that everybody's doing the things and following up on the things that you, that you need to do. Be prepared. That's a good one. Marco, anything you want to add? Yeah. Yeah. Um, apart from the um, standard procedures, which are very important, which I think Steve and Alan pointed out, I think this, this Valentine's day, it's, it's even more crucial than in previous years is to secure volume to have flowers available because last minute things can change, that flights get canceled, weather and so forth. Um, and since the supply chain is already that fragile, I think it would be wise probably to try to get the product in a bit earlier than usual and just to play it safe 
And uh, sometimes it can also be of an advantage to pre-pray the product so that uh, in case there is a shortage, uh, there is a probability that those who prepaid uh, get uh, preferred suppliers over those who haven't prepaid. Um, so these are all things I think which uh, could play a role this Valentine's Day. And uh, yeah, having enough product is really key to get the best out of this holiday. Yep, thanks. Emma, let's see if you can... No, I can't, can, can anyone else hear Emma? No, I can't hear her. She might need to log out and log back in maybe. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that, okay. Okay, we'll just go over to the next one. Um, oh, this one's about flower food for thought. So through your flower food for thought campaign, I learned a lot of tips regarding caring for flowers. So for people who don't know, these are the flower food for thought sachets. It's, those are just three of, of like 40 different designs that we have. And this person says, I love the packets by the way, and always enjoy reading the tips. But what are the two or three things I should recommend my customers do when they get home after buying flowers? Steve. Okay, uh, two or three, uh, without a doubt, um, all of the work that the grower has done, the distributor has done, the airlines, everybody has done, can literally be lost by a dirty base. So um, I would say if you had to give the recommendation that clean base, clean water, and mixing the flower food correctly, that, that part where the customer is actually playing with the flowers, which by the way, we have noticed that that's been written many times how that's part of the enjoyment of getting the flowers is playing with them, putting them in the right place. Uh, it's very common as Society of American Florists has taught here in the U.S. that many bouquets get separated. Uh, one flower may go into the kitchen. One may go even go into the bathroom. It's a very common place. So the, that, that part, um, the playing with the flowers is, is really important, I think. So I say clean and use the flower preservative at the rate that it's designed to be. And you will maximize that base life. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take that one, and I'm sure other people can join in with the other. But that's the one I'm gonna take because that's that's one of those things that assures that enjoyment. Yeah. So clean water and follow the dosing instructions. Clean instructions. clean the base and clean water. Yeah. Clean the base. Yeah. Okay. Emma, are you there? No. So I can't hear you. Then she doesn't know. Okay. Mm. Marco, any tips that you have for florists that they can hand over to their customers? So did you mention my name? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes, um, I think um, time of processing flowers is also quite crucial. So um, next to what Steve said is when you arrive with your flowers at home, try to process them as soon as possible. So use the clean ways, use the right amount of water with the flower food and process them quickly so that flowers don't sit too long at ambient temperature because flowers don't like that. That's certainly an additional device to give. And um, other than that, um, yeah, uh, I think uh, like the important location. things, the locations of course is also important. Yeah, so keep them away from, from uh, heat sources. So if you have a heating system, which is very common this time of the year, don't put them next to the heat sources because flowers wouldn't like that and would certainly, yeah, um, yeah not benefit from it. Yeah, that's true. Alan, and on the way of, <laughs> on the way, sorry, of course, um, watch, uh, I mean, flowers can be very thirsty. Um, so I think it's important to watch that and make sure that they don't run out. Um, so um, probably with a typical bunch of a dozen roses, you need to top up the vase every three to four days probably. Uh, so that's also important because many times people don't look at it, especially when they use vases which are not transparent, which are not crystal clear. Yeah, and then you don't notice that uh, the water might already be gone, and then yeah, after four or five days, the flowers start to wilt, and you wonder why. Yeah, good one, Alan. Anything you want to add? Yeah, just for, uh, just it's not really a, a care tip, but it's an enjoyment tip. Uh, the, uh, that I've seen lots of people do, and uh, in fact, my wife does it at home, is, you know, when you get a bouquet of flowers, you have all these multiple flowers, different flowers will live for different lengths of time. Uh, so one tip is to, to get the maximum enjoyment out of your flowers, 
as the flowers are dying over the time that you have them, and hopefully you're doing a great job of taking care of the flowers, like like Steve and Marco said, changing the base water, properly mixing your flower fruit, very important. Uh, just take pull the dead one out, throw that away, but there'll be other flowers. There'll be other greenery that will still be good. So what you could do, like what I see people doing is then they, as they extract the dead flowers, they'll, they'll just rearrange what's left, recut stems when you change your vase water. And then the other thing you could do is when, if you get a big bouquet, there's many 20 stems in there, 25 stems. Don't think that you have to keep it all in the same place. I mean, uh, what you could do, a neat, t a neat technique is break apart the bouquet, recut the stems, make smaller arrangements with what's left, and then put them in different places in your house so more people in the house get to enjoy them. Put, you know, it doesn't have to sit on your dining table, right? Or it doesn't have to sit in the kitchen. You can put, you can make arrangements for your bedroom. You can make arrangements for the bathrooms or whatever. I just did that with a shipment of tropical flowers uh, I received for Christmas and uh, just kind of spread them around the house. So then you get more enjoyment out of it. And the other thing is that sometimes you don't need to use it doesn't have to be completely full. I mean, the most beautiful arrangements sometimes are defined by what's not there more than what is there. And so you can, one stem in a round vase of a calla lily or something can be absolutely beautiful depending on how it's done and where you show it and hopefully have good quality flowers. So that's another thing to extend the, uh, the enjoyment of your flowers. That's a good idea. A good tip. And, you know, I want to add one thing. Uh, that end consumer, uh, one piece of advice we can pass on is allow the flowers to rehydrate. Many times that final mile to your home is a difficult one. And people always say, oh, the flowers didn't arrive good. I threw them away. Flowers are actually designed to dehydrate and rehydrate. It happens on the farm. It's actually the way that the flowers or the system, the vascular system pulls up all of the elements and energy from the soil. So allow those flowers some time to rehydrate. Uh, give them the 20, 30, 45 minutes. Watch how the flower will rehydrate. Many times people say, oh, I'm not good with flowers. They didn't arrive good, so I just threw them away. What a mistake. Those flowers put into a clean vase with properly mixed flower food, and you'll get the 7 to 12, 14 days, and you go, wow, I thought they were dead. They're not dead. They're just dehydrated. They are designed to rehydrate. So pass that word on. Let the flowers rehydrate. Yeah, let me let me jump on one other thing I just thought about too is, and this may, I don't know if this applies to people specifically in the audience today, but I know that lots of people, it, you know, we're from the flower industry, so we're very comfortable around flowers, of course. But you may have family and friends, you know, obviously other people you know that are not in the flower industry. And I think one of the problems or issues for the consumer is people are afraid to touch flowers. It comes in this beautifully, hopefully arranged vase, beautiful quality, beautiful, and you, you just don't want to touch it because you're afraid you're going to destroy what the way flowers should be enjoyed. There's no rules about around how flowers should be enjoyed, right? So w encourage people that you know to go ahead and take it apart, you know, Touch the stems, recut the stems. Uh, the flowers are actually quite hardy, and uh, like Steve is saying. And so uh, take them out, recut the stems, rearrange them, spread them around your house, make your own arrangements, define your own sense of what is beautiful in flowers, right? So, uh, but don't be afraid to touch them. I think the more people are comfortable around flowers and handling flowers, the industry actually will do better. So um, uh, that's another thing. That's a good one. And the recutting of stems, that's a good one to mention as well, as well as removing the leaves below the water level so the water stays as clean as possible. So a really good one. Right. Okay. Thanks for the tips, guys. Um, so I have a specific question about, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce it correctly, gypsophilia. And the question is, how can we stop flowers from ripening and browning? Let's see if we can get Emma to answer that one. No. Is there anyone think, else who would? Yeah, I think Emma's computer needs to be, uh, just to recognize her, uh, never mind, her recognize her, her, her microphones on her computer. Um, okay. I, I, can, I, can, I can start fielding that question. So, um, Gypsophilia, Gyps, Gypsophila, uh, named uh, a lot of ways, Baby's Breath, another name. Um, so, this is a multi floral crop. 
uh, that many times um, will actually have an apical or a controlling bloom that'll open and then you will get uh, one after another, it'll develop slowly. Um, in order for that to occur fully, uh, the farm has used uh, several post-harvest techniques, including, and it's important, including the use of something called cerebrophile sulfate, and it may be pulsed uh, also with uh, some from hormones and products to assure that the smaller buds continue to open. So what you receive on day one uh, may be a very tight cut, but by day five, seven, you will basically triple, quadruple, or maybe even 10 times, depending on the variety, the number of buds that open. Um, unfortunately, sometimes the older buds tend to start getting a little darker in color. So there might be a need to remove some of those. But for the most part, temperature is the effectiveness when you start getting a lot of browning. So the cold chain is very important with Jip, Gypsophila, baby's breath. So please adhere to the cold chain wherever possible, number one. Number two, uh, you want to get some of that free moisture. I'm talking about the retailer and the, the wholesaler and uh, the supermarket people who are receiving this. You want to get that latent heat that's built up in the box because a, a Jip box can literally, literally get 200 degrees Fahrenheit if you let it alone. It'll actually start to respirate, generate heat, and it'll actually start to go into a cycle of heating. We don't want that to happen. Obviously, that's a product that won't make it to market. So what we want to do is, is when you receive the JIP, inspect it. Open up that box, get that latent heat out of the box, get the cold air in there, slow down that respiration rate. So the cold chain is very important. And uh, if you want the open stage a little, you're going to need to put them into a properly mixed flower fruit solution and allow them to start hydrating and getting that openness that you're looking for. So um, temperature adherence, uh, buying from a reputable source who's post-harvest treating correctly and uh, getting the heat out of the box. And ultimately you definitely wanna make sure you use uh, properly mixed flower food into that rehydration to assure the increase in bud opening and giving that customer that nice white look or whatever color you've selected um, into, the, into the bouquet or into the arrangement. Okay, thanks for that, Steve. Um, the next question is, it's quite a long one, so bear with me. I've always been told to be careful to pair flowers of similar vase life and behavior together when designing bouquets. However, I've heard that in recent years, breeders have focused on strengthening flower varieties that have been known to be weak or fragile. And so the question is, what do you know about these, this new trend? Um, what do you recommend? And are there any specific flower varieties that are part of this breakthrough. Steve, it's for you. Yeah, yeah, I, I stole Emma's chip one, but let me just, uh, this is an interesting thing. And, and here at Floral Life, we actually enjoy um, a lot of this conversation because breeders actually will bring products to us for testing. Um, when I say testing, basically seeing what the market will do to a new variety, whether it be vase life or how does it handle transportation? Is it ethylene sensitive? Um, we have a gas chromatograph to measure ethylene levels. So many questions come up on a new flower variety. Um, we are seeing a, a trend um, to where we're getting flowers that in the past weren't great travelers. And I'm using the word travelers as a catch-all. That flowers uh, didn't make it to market in good condition. It could have been because uh, they weren't good hydration uh, type varieties or they were highly ethylene sensitive and the industry wasn't aware of that. Um, and then through our testing, and I say our, the industry testing, Floral Life taking a role in that, uh, we've found out that a simple post-harvest treatment or shipping treatment has now given this flower, which at one time was not a good one to get to market, a very long life, and it becomes a very good traveler. Um, uh, we have new lily varieties. We have new rose varieties constantly looking up. Um, Sometimes those flowers need to be recognized in which channel they belong. So a flower that works very well in the retail uh, wedding or, 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 or uh, certain channel may not do real well in the supermarket channel where the flower size is much smaller and the handling of flowers is much rougher on the flower. So uh, finding the right channel for the flower might actually be a, a one of the solutions to this. And... Um, the breeders are playing with genetics. Uh, 
uh, you might have heard uh, uh, the word CRISPR. Uh, they're actually piecing genetical things into the DNA of flowers that may give new colors uh, or new aspects, maybe not as ethylene sensitive as the past one. Um, petal count changes. So all these things that I'm just throwing out here are all things that are taking into effect that we are seeing new flower types or an old flower type that we never thought would work in our channel becoming a player. Uh, the one I'm going to just give out that everybody will recognize is hydrangea. Hydrangea is definitely a hydration sensitive crop. We are now learning through either new variety or new cut stage or, or new age of the plant. We're moving hydrangeas into actually ocean freight shipping and the flowers are performing beautifully. So it's really an understanding of the genetics of the flowers and how it can play a role in our channel. So uh, partner with your suppliers. Um, trial and error is also a great way. We are a great resource for you at Floralife if you want some help with that. But long story made short, it's exciting. We're seeing new flowers in new places and people love to try something different and they love to learn about something. I never forget, I was standing at a, a, at a supermarket once and somebody walked up and goes, what is that flower? And I said, it's, uh, it's Bulplarium. And they're like, what? <laughs> All of a sudden, they bought a big bunch of Bulplarium because she was positive she'd be the only one in her social circle to know that it was Bulplarium. Um, it was lucky that I knew it was Bulplarium. But what I'm trying to say is people love to learn something. And uh, these new flower types are definitely Interesting. Thank you. There's a question about our products and it's, can you please explain why we should use a professional floral cleaner versus bleach? Anyone interested in answering that one? Yeah, I can, I can jump in and, on that one, but I, because I think uh, uh, Emma should answer this question, but I think Emma's microphone is not working still. So uh, yeah, fundamentally when we go into the market, uh, we know that sanitation uh, is one of the, primary reasons you will not get proper vase life, vase life out of flowers. What happens is bacteria will grow. Bacteria are ubiquitous. They're everywhere. Even after cleaning, there is some population of bacteria still on surfaces. So you will, uh, they will begin to multiply in as little as 20 minutes. Uh, and uh, the bacteria will multiply and then they will begin to uh, attack or attract themselves or uh, because the, the flowers are absorbing water flow into the xylem, which are the uh, uh, vascular system of flowers in the stem. That's how water moves up the stem. And they end up physically blocking the xylem, which prevents the flower from being able to properly hydrate, which shortens face life. Uh, so it's important to clean, or I should probably use the word sanitize or disinfect <clears throat> to uh, prevent that bacteria population from exploding inside a bucket or a vase. So the main things people use, we often see in the industry are they use common bleach uh, or they will use uh, some kind of uh, approved disinfection cleaner. Here's the difference. Uh, and I think Steve, it was Steve that alluded to this earlier. Uh, bleach, uh, which is sodium, typically sodium hypochlorite is the active ingredient there, uh, is a very, very effective uh, dis uh, disinfectant. Um, so it will kill bacteria very effectively. Here's the problem. The problem with bleach or sodium hypochlorite is that it lasts, it's highly reactive uh, to, uh, to air sunlight. So as soon as it, you make it and it gets exposed, uh, it begins to, it works, but then it begins to quickly break down to oxidize. And the problem there is it might do a great job of killing the bacteria population present at that moment, but as the, bac it never kills 100%. So as the bacteria continue to multiply later, uh, it will not be present and effective to kill the bacteria then. Uh, so we always recommend using a different kind of cleaner. Uh, for example, our product is DCD. It's based on something called quaternary ammonium. And what it does is it doesn't react with the environment. It's a very, very, it's a 50 year old technology. Uh, it's used in a lot of healthcare settings and it will kill the bacteria. Uh, and after you clean, it will actually remain on the surface so that the other bacteria coming later 
uh, it will also be uh, killed or taken care of because the product will still be present on the surface. Uh, so that's the primary difference between using a bleach and using uh, some other uh, disinfection product like our DCD product, uh, because with the non-bleach products, you get a much longer lasting killing effect. I hope that I hope that wasn't confusing. I hope that explained it. Thank you, Alan. Emma, I think, I think you're back, if I'm not mistaken. Is there anything that you wanted to add on to what Alan was saying? Uh, she's but now mute. you're really on mute. Yeah, something. I, I can't, maybe. Can you hear beeping or not? Yay, good job. Oh, yeah, you can wear yours. Yay, IT sorted it out for me, or they are sorting it out for me. Perfect. Yes. So please repeat the question because my mind was. <laughs> so why should professionals use the professional floral cleaner versus bleach? Ah, oh, yes, yes, yes. Perfect. Yes. So as Steve mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, the thing about the professional floral cleaners is that they have residual effect. So they will do a really good job of um, cleaning, just as bleach would. But the benefit you'll get from using a professional cleaner is that the cleaning effect carries on. It lasts longer. So it prevents the buildup of bacteria and, and molds and things like that uh, ongoing. So it's not just a one-shot deal where it'll, it'll be clean and then that's it and it'll just start getting dirty again. It actually has some residual effect. So it can protect it for longer, basically. And one, one other one other benefit that Emma and I were talking about one day was uh, bleach is also not great for your clothes. For, uh, the, the, the industry floral cleaners are a lot friendlier um, for the user as well. So, for example, our, our product is um, it's used in many industries that it's based out. What I'm trying to say is um, people who misuse bleach usually uh, have clothes like uh, I'm wearing at the moment, all stained. Uh, so long story made short, another benefit uh, to the uh, floral cleaner, a little friendlier. Okay, so now we're over to sustainability. What new sustainability initiatives are we seeing in the floral industry? Steve. Yep, um, this is one that I see I, I prepared for because um, it's important that um, we all as an industry know that our industry is working toward some sustainable issues. And, and we all need to take part in it. And uh, I'll give you some real quick examples. Um, our industry has had some very bad press in the past about use of insecticides, for example. And I'll just give you one quick example of this. In the past, uh, it was Tuesday, you went out and sprayed insecticide. On Thursday, you sprayed another insecticide. You just did it. It was part of the protocol of growing a certain crop. That no longer is the protocol. Now there are insect traps at all the farms. The insect traps uh, basically measure the, um, the, the presence of certain uh, insects and not only measures them, but it makes sure that they're viable males. And believe it or not, one of the things that is being done in the industry is we're actually sending out what we call blind males. So they, you actually buy insects that are unable to reproduce, and you may actually go into a greenhouse and release a certain number of them. And just by sending out blind males, you reduce the population close to zero, if not zero, of that insect. So there are two benefits. One, the ecological benefit is clear. The second benefit, believe it or not, is economic. So be aware that our industry are looking not only for ways to become more sustainable, but in many cases become more effective cost-wise as well. The use of recycled materials, um, the use of uh, uh, certain corrugated, which is recycled, certain plastics, which break down. I know at Floralife, somebody else can mention that one uh, in a minute. But the other thing I wanted to mention is, and most importantly, uh, is the fact that if we take care of the product from the farm all the way through the consumer, and the consumer does get that enjoyment, the product is used. The number one way uh, that we recognize uh, literally least available uh, is to throw the product away. Imagine all the effort, cost uh, that it goes to a product, it gets to the market, it doesn't perform, we throw it away. All of that ecologically is a complete waste. If we could assure the product to move from the farm all the way to the consumer and is enjoyed, that is the number one way to become sustainable. So take part 
take your everybody needs to take part in their responsibility to assure the protocols, the cold chain, the use of flour food, for example, the, the, all that. So the product does go all the way through. So we don't throw anything away. Uh, I think those are the two points I wanted to make. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Alan, was there something that you wanted to add on to that? Uh, yeah, we did a, a, a working with Mark Allen, who is really the expert in sustainability at Flora Life. Um, we looked at or estimated last year that there are about six and a half billion stems that enter the U.S. market uh, each year. And our estimate was about 15 percent of those stems that are harvested and shipped actually never make it uh, into an arrangement that a consumer would enjoy. So if you take 15% of 6 million, it's almost a billion stems that are being disposed of uh, every year uh, just for the U.S. market. And you can imagine what that number must be like globally. So I agree. I want to add on to what Steve is saying that waste reduction is probably, uh, from our viewpoint, the biggest thing the industry can do to become more sustainable. And I think Steve touched on that, not just the stem itself, but all of the inputs, uh, fertilizer, uh, uh, handling, labor, carbon from the transportation and packaging materials. I mean, all of that goes along with that stem being disposed of. So we think that uh, waste reduction is probably the number one thing that the industry could do. Indeed, yeah. Emma, I have a question for you. This one is, what time-saving tips do you have to streamline the process during peak times, like Valentine's Day? Ah, yes. So especially for, for florists, um, I would say, peak times, the holiday events, um, even wedding events, things like that. So things where you have a huge influx of stems coming in in a short period of time uh, that are getting processed through that florist business in sort of 24 to 48 hours. Um, one time saving thing that they can do is use um, Floralife Express 200 uh, storage solution. And the reason for that is the Express solution is designed to be used with flowers that have not been recut. So by using that product, what they can do is literally bring their stems in, unpack them and just place them directly. With, and this is, slightly blasphemous for me to say, but put them directly into the holding solution without recutting uh, and without actually, only for events, I will use that caveat, without cleaning the leaves off the bottom of the stems. So, so long as they're storing their flowers, no more than 24 hours if it's, they're storing an ambient, and I would say maybe up to 48 hours if they're keeping them in the cold chain, uh, they can actually store their flowers like that. So the benefit is, there's less damage to those stems. So very often at peaks, there will be um, more temporary workers coming in. So just seasonal workers coming into that florist shop that have to be trained, um, don't always do things as routinely. So it's, it's very new to them. Um, and so there's a big chance that those stems could be damaged by inexperienced people basically. But by removing that extra step, you don't have to clean all the, the flat leaves off the bottom of the stems. You don't have to recut. Literally, just unpack them, place them in the buckets with the solution. Uh, so long as those flowers are used within 24 ambient and 40 hours, if they're kept in cool, um, they won't suffer. Uh, actually, they'll be hydrated. Plus, they won't suffer uh, from any damage. Um, the Designers will then recut the stem and strip those leaves off anyway, the ones that they do need to. So it's going to be better for the flower because there's less handling and less stress from all that stripping that they would normally do. So for peaks, I definitely think the Express 200 is a very useful tool for florists to cut down on time for processing those flowers and really put it to, to the use that it was designed for. So it's something that the flowers can use in their arsenal to sort of streamline that process and really make use of the time and the workers that they do have more efficiently. Very good tip, thank you. Okay, we have a question from a non-believer. I do not feel I need to spend money on flower food in my shop. 
Why the expense? I change my bucket water daily and recut stems and instruct my customers to do the same. And that seems to work just fine. Prove me wrong. Emma, do you yeah. dare to prove me wrong? I do. So one thing about flower food, uh, well, if we go back to what the florist is currently doing, that is a huge amount of time and labor uh, and water usage every day. So using flower food, you're actually going to be saving water, you're going to be saving time from that processing, and you're actually going to be doing something better for your flowers by using the food. So what the, the food does, it replaces everything that the roots and the leaves would have done in nature. So there's food in there, there's other things to keep the, the stems clear. So the flowers are going to benefit. How the florist benefits is, if the florist takes into account the time that she, they're spending processing those flowers every day, um, I'm sure they could be using that time more efficiently for other things in the business, uh, promotions, bookkeeping, anything that they need to do. So it's it's they're saving money in the long run, if I put it that way, and they're doing something better for their flowers by using the flower food. And the consumer at the end of the day will also be receiving a better product. So the flowers will be in, will live longer basically. So it's a win-win. So I definitely recommend it for the little few pennies that you spend per bucket to, to treat your flowers correctly, it, you're gonna get a lot more in return. Definitely also helps a lot with uh, rotation of product because uh, not all flowers are sold within one or two days. Uh, some flowers can stay in a store or shop up to a week in the florist. In, and uh, if you only use plain water, I think there's a very high risk that uh, many of those flowers will not make it and uh, will be shrinked. And I um, mean, we all know the cost of a flower. We all know the cost to treat a bucket which holds a significant value of flowers. So it's a pretty easy math. If you save one stem, in the bucket, it already pays for flower food through for several buckets. That's as easy as it is. That's a good one. That's a really good calculation. That makes it more tangible for people to understand how small the investment is and how big the return is on that. It's a good one. Thank you. Okay, Steve, this one's for you. I always hear that condensation on floral packaging is wrong, but I never really understood why. Can you please explain? Sure. Um, first of all, uh, condensation is basically uh, moisture or, or water that's trapped in the air. And then when there's a temperature change from either cold to hot or hot to cold, uh, it, that moisture falls out of the air and it adheres to packaging or the flowers themselves. Um, so when you say that it's not good, it's not good when it reaches a, an amount of, it, of water. Uh, and it basically then starts to soften the floral tissue and possibly then allowing fungal bacterial growth to occur. Um, don't forget anaerobic or without oxygen is the way some of those things develop. And if the spore is present, which from what Alan just reminded us, those spores are omnipresent everywhere, um, ubiquitous everywhere. What I was pointing out though is that a certain amount of moisture is natural, especially when flowers move through the cold chain and may have a fluctuation. What we don't want is full water. So when you tilt over a sleeve, water runs out. That basically is too much moisture. It's, we know that's softening the tissue. Um, many times it prevents the flower from cooling back down. It also allows fungal bacterial growth to, um, to, to again, to, to enter into um, the flower structure or the plant structure, stems, leaves, etc. Uh, a real simple solution to that is uh, to basically allow to release that moisture, whether it be a box, open up that box in the cooler, allow that latent heat to get out. Um, uh, along with that heat, the moisture will also leave. It'll get trapped. We, we want to make sure we have high enough humidity not to dehydrate the flower. The ideal Industry level is about 75% relative humidity is this ideal. Um, but if the flowers are in properly mixed flower food, uh, as the flower loses some humidity, it'll be replaced by the vascular system. So uh, you wanna make sure that you get any free flowing moisture off the flower. 
uh, to protect it from fungal bacterial growth. Emma, did I forget anything on that? No, 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 that's all perfect, perfect. So Steve, you mentioned relative humidity. Um, Emma, maybe you can help explain what that is? Yeah, yeah, it's actually very simple. So relative humidity is basically the amount of water that the air can hold. So there, in every environment, there's a certain of moisture in the air. The relative humidity is basically how much water there is in the air at any given time. Thanks for that. Yeah. Um, oh, this was a question that we got for our last webinar, but we didn't get round to it. Um, and it was, we thought it was still interesting to ask. So that's why it's on this list. It's why are red roses difficult to find at Christmas? And why aren't growers just growing more of them? Steve, help us out here. Yeah, I think Marco and I can handle this one because uh, we work with the growers um, in different parts of the world, but in similar situations. So in order for me to have a flower or a rose present on a certain date, I need to tell the plant to make one. How do I do that? I actually go to the plant uh, on a rose and I will actually pinch it. Pinch it means I will cut off a point and I will make the rose then generate a stem, I'm gonna use the word stem, or a point of accent, to, to, to generate a, um, a bud, which will be the flower. Um, it's kind of uh, telling the plant what to do and when to do it. Uh, every variety has a different cycle. Every farm, depending on its temperature, altitude, uh, believe it or not, even the number, of the, how low the temperature will go at night, Every farm really will have a different day count. And this is the difficulty in growing flowers. It's also the science of it. It's also the beauty of it. I could actually go to a farm uh, in one part of Ecuador, for example, and I will ask the agronomist, when did you pinch? At this farm, we need to pinch X number of days on this variety, X number of days on that variety. And then he'll say, hopefully, we're not going to have any freezes. Remember, we mentioned about the freezing issue. Hope we don't have any freezes. Hopefully, we have enough water, but not too much. It is literally um, playing with the um, the cycle of the rose of the plant to generate this 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 flower. It is frustrating when you've done all that work, the manual labor of pinching, uh, the measurement, the fertilization. Uh, in some cases, we believe it or not, in some parts of the world. We actually add carbon dioxide into the greenhouses. Uh, some crops, you add lights to make sure the flower comes on time. It is literally a science. And then one day you wake up and there's a, a 18 hour freeze and everything goes in. It is heartbreaking. Uh, the reason I mentioned that is because I don't want you to think that it's easy to do. It is a science. Uh, you would not believe how hard it is to produce a flower, but at the same time, how beautiful it is when it happens. And um, in order for us to produce this product, when I say us, the whole industry, uh, we all have to play our role in following all those protocols from the grower who's pinching the rows to all the way through to you offering it to that consumer, giving them that advice that we're touching on today to make sure they get those days. And, and a little education never hurts. So pass on the word. Marco, in, in Africa, do they do the same thing? It's basically the same, of course, and yeah, it, it's it's simply impossible, of course, to build a business model around a particular day where the volume is, I would say, five, six times higher than in the regular week, and then the other weeks, of course, um, the volume is even lower. So um, the only way you can do it is is what Steve just described. Uh, you cut back the crop, uh, you have lower production then towards Valentine's Day, but then. On Valentine's Day, you have that massive, massive flush in order to cope with the increased demand. And uh, that's that's what it's about. So Christmas and Valentine's Day are too close together to, to get roses for both. The right. The plant, the plant can't, can't grow a rose at Christmas and then recuperate and then grow another rose for about. So which is also the explanation why after Mother's Day, after that harvest, we have another flush in the summertime in the US because the harvest itself generates a pinch. So then all of a sudden in the summertime, we have roses, which is a good time to promote rose use, right? And there are several rose promotions in the summertime that take advantage of that post Mother's Day uh, flush. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Great. This one is about water quality. So I always hear water quality is very important, but how do I know if I'm using the right quality of water in my buckets and bases? What is good water? What is bad water? What recommendations and what steps do you, do you have for me? Steve. Yeah. Um, yes. So uh, we're going to go ahead and talk about water quality at, uh, at the marketplace, not at grower level, because that's a totally different science. Um, we'll just talk about here. So it's important for you to be aware of where your water comes from. Um, if you're using city water, um, that's usually a good thing because at least it's potable, but doesn't mean that it's not hard water. So hard water means that there's something other than H2O in your water. By the way, it's not dangerous. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, here in the U.S., we put things like fluoride into the water. Uh, believe it or not, fluoride is not great for flowers. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is that anything that's not H2O generates a hardness of the water. There are several measurements on water. Uh, the hardness is one. Uh, the, the electric conductivity is another. Uh, I think it's more important that rather than go down the science road here, go down the be aware of where your water comes from. If you live in a community that may be drawing well water, and all of a sudden you notice that, you know what, lilies tend not to last at certain time of year, or all of a sudden you're getting really poor vase life. You may wanna reach out to your water source and be aware that, yes, when the rains came in, uh, or, hot, or, or with, there's a drought, the water quality that's coming to your shop or your store is changing. So be aware of where your water comes from, um, reach out to your flower food provider. Uh, we actually work uh, with people who have varying qualities of water. Um, the most common water is, uh, is great for the flowers. Unfortunately, there are pockets all around the country in the U.S. and I assume in Europe as well that have varying qualities. And it's kind of strange. Sometimes you can literally be one block away from one water source to another and they're two totally different waters and the flowers will show that fact that they're two totally different waters. So reach out to uh, Floralife. Uh, we can definitely help you with that. But uh, I got to go back to the main point. Please be aware of where your water comes from. And if during the year, it may vary in quality because of where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. Good one. Okay, this is going to be our last question, I think, because we only have three minutes left. Um, and this one is from someone with a flower store. And they're asking, which flower food type should I use at my store? I get over overwhelmed with the different kinds that are available. I need a recommendation for storage and for final arrangements I make. I have been told that they should be different kinds, but why? Emma, maybe you can help us out for people in the, in the European yeah. market. Oh yeah, for sure. So Floral Life, we actually um, have our flower foods sort of numbered for easy use. So there's three different ranges. There's the 100 series, the 200 series, and the 300 series. And basically what that means is those each one is for a different stage in the flower's life. So anything 100 is for just for hydration, uh, aimed at growers. So very early on after a flower has been harvested, that's the where the 100 sits. The 200 level of flower food that is for storage and transit. So that would be something that would be used by florists for um, flowers that are incoming into their shop, uh, for storing them, for hydrating them. It, it, it does everything for that. Uh, it's also in buckets in supermarkets. So it's really just to, uh, like a holding solution is what we sort of term it. So anything that they are storing in their shop should have uh, either an express 200 flower food in the, in the bucket. Anything for arrangements is going to be a 300 level product. And that is always in a sachet. It could be a liquid, it could be a powder. Um, there are cases if you have a mixed bouquet with roses, we do recommend a, a rose food for that. So the idea behind that is the rose tends to be the weakest flower in the bunch. And so you feed the weakest flower basically. But uh, otherwise, uh, a universal 300 level flower food in a sachet food, anything that is going to a consumer, anything that be, gets used in the consumer's home would be in the 300 range. Yeah. Alan, how about the US North American market? 
Is it similar? Oh, you're on oh. mute. Ditto everything that Emma just said. Real quick, uh, in the U.S. market, culturally, people like their flowers a bit more open. And so many retail shops will use a 300-level solution in the vase or the arrangement, the foam arrangement that is going to the consumer um, uh, because they want their flowers to be a bit more open. And the 300 solutions have higher levels of sugar in them. Uh, but that would be everything, ditto everything that Emma just said, but that's one small difference between the U.S. and Europe. Okay. Thanks for that. Okay, where it's exactly time. One hour has passed. We've answered almost every single question that we had. Thank you experts so much for your time and for your answers and uh, for entertaining us with, with all the information. And thank you everyone who attended and um, joined us for this webinar. Um, keep your social media, keep an eye out on social media for the next webinar and the topic. Um, and in the meantime, if you have any questions for us, for the experts, send them to marketing at florlife.com. Just add it in the chat. Any questions you have about flowers, the floral industry, send them to us and we'll make sure that the right person answers your question. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you everyone and have a great day. Good luck thank for Valentine's Day, everybody. Good luck. Yeah, good luck to Valentine's Day. Thanks, everybody.